thank you all for coming. This will be a little different shift than the previous uh, talk. Um, just disclosures, I have done work related, <clears throat> related to the bioreactants technology. I have funding from the National Institutes of Health as well. Other disclosures, I'm not a biomedical engineer. I'm a clinician trying to kind of understand these things that are out there that are trying to be sold to us. And I suspect for those of you that may be a biomedical engineer, hopefully I don't horribly misunderstand or misstate something here. I worked a lot, 30 years sounds like a long time, but unfortunately maybe it's true with a lot of different flow technologies. And the truth is most of them work better in theory than they do in practice. And I've gotten a little jaded over the years simply by working with devices that are supposed to work and maybe they do, but most of the time they don't in the clinical environment where we need them. And uh, kind of getting into the idea of not trusting a cookbook approach to things, I'm becoming a little concerned that maybe we're getting a little too, too trusting of numbers that appear on the screen as a composite from a lot of the devices that are out there that are basically telling us if the number's 10, we should do X, if the number's 12, we should do Y. And I think most of us with our understanding of physiology need to have an appreciation of where that number's coming from and what actually the limitations of it are. So what do we have out there for conventional monitoring that we run through? Well, it's our basic uh, non-invasive monitors for blood pressure and heart rate and oxygen saturation. Moving on to what I call minimally or moderately invasive, an arterial catheter, central venous or transesophageal echocardiography, and then invasive monitors, and we're talking more about flow today, so we're gonna concentrate on thermolution cardiac output some for a pulmonary artery catheter. Let me get a poll for you. How many of you have put in a pulmonary artery catheter for a cardiac surgery, let's say, in the last two months? Okay, not that many. How many have put in a pulmonary artery catheter for a non-cardiac surgery in the last two months? And there's very few. And I think that's following the direction that we're beginning to see with the literature suggesting that maybe outcomes aren't enhanced by the use of PA catheters. Which gets us on to the central idea of what's gonna happen next with these devices. This is one of my sons. But I think it gets to the fundamental question here, although we're using them less and we have concerns about their safety, they're still the clinical standard that we're using for comparing flow devices generally as to the cardiac output. Well, I work a lot in the laboratory, and what is the laboratory gold standard? And it relates to flow probes on the aorta of the pulmonary artery. And there's really, for those of you that hadn't seen it, there's two main ways these work. There's an ultrasonic probe here, there's an electromagnetic probe here, both of which fit around the major vessel you're interested in, and they generate a velocity signal. This is a fixed area of each of these. The machine knows the area, and velocity times area equals volume flow. And this is essentially the laboratory gold standard, and it's one that we've used both in an animal lab and in a clinical setting. Just as an example of the things that we use for these models would be a left ventricular pressure and an aortic flow, and commonly we'll superimpose on things like arterial pressure, left ventricular volume in green, right ventricular pressure, and in our standard models generally come out as well of superimposing pulmonary arterial flow simultaneously, so we're actually able to look at a lot of simultaneous events and extract some of the subtleties of these different methodologies. Over 20 years ago, we published this study in 1992 looking at standard thermal dilution. We were looking at a new type of pulmonary artery catheter, and we, re we used it in a controlled laboratory setting. This was done in large dogs. And when the conditions are meticulously controlled, there's a wonderful correlation between electromagnetic flow and thermal dilution flow, and the average, the percent error in this is quite small, it's 11%. We then use the same device in a clinical setting as we would in cardiac surgical patients, again comparing it to an electromagnetic flow probe put on the aorta, and we found the exact same device used in our clinical setting produced an error of 38%. So when we look at any method comparison studies, we have to consider the response time between your reference and what you're actually looking at for a new technology, whether you're looking at a snapshot, which is what I would say multiple thermal dilution boluses are, relative to a new device that's continuously measuring flow, and are the new and the reference measures measuring really the same thing. And this may sound a little silly, but some of the things we've shown, for example, that if I measure ejection from the right ventricle and the left ventricle simultaneously, and I'm rapidly giving a fluid bolus, the flow goes up on the right side of the heart well before it goes up the left side of the heart, and I think average these data over a period of time with one technology looks at LV ejection and one looks at RV ejection, we can actually come up with a difference between the two of them. Many of you may have seen the, or used, how many have used the, the CCO, the Continuous Cardiac Output Device? 
as well, I think most of us have, which is an interesting device. It's essentially reverse thermal elution. It heats the blood instead of us injecting our cold bowls. And you'll find studies that have been done in the past that have compared new technologies to, con to continuous CCO devices. One of the issues related to this that many may have been seen actually was published when the devices first came out in the early 90s. In this study, they, they uh, looked at flow from a CCO catheter uh, relative to an ultrasound flow probe, UFP, during a variety of different interventions to raise or decrease blood flow. And they then looked at the time it took to produce a 20% change of the maximum and compared the time for the ultrasonic flow probe to that produced by the continuous cardiac output device. And what they found was that there are actually large differences in the time it took for the CCO to detect a change. And this, cha this time difference was the greatest for when they gave a fluid bolus. And it was actually, it, whereas the uh, ultrasound took 30 seconds or half a minute to detect a change, it was over seven minutes for the CCO. What this gets to is the idea that when we're comparing technologies and we're looking at different references, we have to consider the, how rapidly the reference can respond. So if we're comparing a new method to continuous cardiac output and we're doing a fluid bolus, we may actually miss the relative changes between the two. All right, so as our things have evolved, what do we have now to, to aid our monitoring? Well, I've added in the non-invasive tissue oxygenation, or which can be a probe that's put on, and really the emphasis now is on towards stroke volume management, and there's a variety that I put in the minimally or moderately invasive group from transesophageal Doppler, a range of methodologies that are based on pulse contour analysis, a couple that are dependent on airway instrumentation. And for the sake of time today, we really can't go through each of these, but we're going to focus on this group in the non-invasive group, which are also directed towards assessing stroke volume. Now, just a quick note on why non-invasive monitoring. Okay, we can think of a few things. You can apply it to a patient group that you otherwise wouldn't do extensive monitoring in. You can do it uh, in an outpatient setting. You can start it prior to the surgery and continue it easily afterwards. But how many of you, in the course of your practice, have used the oximeter on yourself, or taken your blood pressure, or taken your own EKG, or put the uh, nearest oximeter on your head to see what your cerebral oximetry? Let's be honest, I think we probably have all done this. So I put this in the category, one of the nice things about non-invasive monitoring is it allows clinicians, I say, to more critically evaluate the technology before they apply it to other patients, or in other words, we get to play with the device. I think this is probably a double-edged sword from the standpoint of the manufacturer, because if you use the device and you become familiar with it, you may like it. And at the same time, if you use it on yourself and you start to measure things that you don't believe, you may come to dislike whatever this is. And having said that, having spent 30 years looking at a lot of different devices, I've done a lot of these on myself, my wife, my kids, the family dog, and it's the same with the Nikon device that we're going to talk about. One of the things that is kind of interesting to me is signal loss. For, so, for example, a lot of these I'm interested in using postoperatively. And if the device intermittently cuts out or it doesn't give me continuous data, then I may not think it uh, has a great deal of utility. So one of the first things I did with some of these devices is I actually put them on myself at night. I move around a lot at night. My worry is I'll wake up in the morning and I'll look and there'll be big data gaps, which will make me concerned about using this in an ICU patient postoperatively. Well, this is one of the first times I used one of these, and I say, well, interestingly here, it's telling me that at one time during the night my cardiac index was 1.5 liters a minute. Well, obviously this device doesn't work because that would suggest I'm in heart failure and I am woke up, I feel pretty good this morning. But if you look far enough in, in the past, actually this has been described in 1967 where they looked at the relationship of cardiovascular function and sleep stages and during non-REM sleep there's profound cardiovascular depression. So my initial bias was that it probably didn't work when in fact it may well have detected an event that was real. I tend to also push the limits on these. We run a pretty large experimental animal laboratory. So this, for example, is a device that's measuring at a heart rate of 202, a stroke volume of 2.2 cc's, and a small rabbit for cardiac output of 444 milliliters per minute. And here we have another one. It's a cardiac output of 21 liters with a stroke volume of 460 cc's. Well, obviously, this is nonsense with a heart rate of 46. This is actually a 318 kilogram horse. 46 is tachycardic for an anesthetized horse. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen these, but there's some really complex horse procedures that are done. They make the animals supine. They may do laparoscopy. 
And if you have a half million dollar lace racehorse with its legs stinging up in the air, one of their big concerns is myopathy. So they empirically run dibutamine during the course of these to try to maintain blood flow and blood pressure to lessen the risk of a myopathy. And I think if I, order, if I owned a racehorse and the word myopathy started to circulate, I'd probably get a little bit concerned. So this is actually a setting of an animal that is uh, receiving dibutamine to maintain blood pressure and flow. Have no idea if this has any relevance to what the actual measurement is. But if you look in the literature, the reported cardiac index for anesthetized horses reading debut receiving dibutamine is between 54 and 73 milliliters per kilogram, and our calculation here is 67 milliliters per kilogram. So whether or not it's absolutely accurate, I can't tell you, but it's certainly in the ballpark, and the machine has sufficient fidelity to pick this up in a massive animal. Well, let's look at some of these other methodologies. Have any of you used the USCOM system? It's a device you see, it fits in the sternal notch, it measures the velocity of blood being ejected in the aorta, estimates the cross-sectional area, almost like transesophageal Doppler. It produces this nice tracing and it estimates the stroke volume from that. Um, it's a device that's been out there. And like transthoracic trans echo, I don't think it's particularly amenable to our use intraoperatively because technically it's going to be impossible to do. Next has to do with the next fin. This is uh, the, old, the new iteration of the old finipress system to non-invasively measure blood pressure in your finger. Uh, it's been refined and actually from the blood pressure standpoint, the literature would suggest it seems to work pretty well. It provides an external pressure to compress the digital arteries. Uh, it's able to then estimate what the pulsatility is in the finger. It uses a mathematical transformation to model what the brachial pressure would be. And the software now takes that non-invasive arterial pressure, applies a pulse control or uh, algorithm to it to try to estimate stroke volume. And it gets into this idea of based on the systolic pressure and the physiological three element wind kessel. You'll see this quite a bit. Let's be honest, how many of us really understand what a three element wind kessel is? But it's out there all the time and a lot of the devices we're using are predicated on this estimate. And it shows up as a line do we really understand what it means and what the limitations are? This is the general idea of pulse contour analysis, whether it's from an arterial pressure waveform or whether it's from a non-invasively derived arterial waveform, and essentially takes the area under the arterial pressure curve, uh, integrates it, or more commonly, it just looks at the pulse pressure, the maximum minus the minimum, and it takes this, this value and divides it by this characteristic or the aortic impedance. And this gets into this three element wind kessel model. This is a complex number that actually involves resistive, elastic, and reflective components of the circulation, and is really hard to come up with an adequate model and estimate what it is, which is why a lot of the devices out there, like the PICO and the LIDCO, and those, for example, make a cardiac output measurement and use that cardiac output measurement from a different methodology to calibrate the stroke volume from a pulse contour analysis. Or in other words, they're deriving what this Z value is. A lot of people have simplified this into essentially pulse pressure times a, a factor K, which takes into consideration this factor. And this is kind of interesting. Have any of you seen this device? It's a newer non-invasive device. Uh, the company I stopped by their booth the other day, they're not showing it here because it's not yet available in the United States. But it uses, instead of using a derived arterial pressure waveform from a finger pulse, it uses the EKG and the plethysmography waveform to estimate a pulse wave transit time, or the time it takes from a pulse being generated in the heart to be propagated to the radial artery in your hand. And they are under the belief that the pulse pressure relationship that you can find from a pulse contour is actually can be estimated also by the pulse wave transit time with a couple of other factors in there. And they're trying to derive a completely non-invasive stroke volume measurement using this pulse wave transit time from the EKG and a plethysmography. A variation of this is available in another methodology. This, this company had a uh, poster that I saw the other day that uses pulse contour and they integrate also this pulse wave transit time as kind of a quality control and integrate the two together. I don't believe they yet have a commercial device, but you'll probably see it somewhere in the near future. Well, the sort of the grandfather of all non-invasive cardiac output monitoring is thoracic bioimpedance. Have any of you used bioimpedance devices? There's a few folks out there. And the general idea of bioimpedance is, and this was developed a long time ago, in fact, they tried to 
apply some of this to astronauts to estimate what their cardiac output was, is if you apply a high frequency, low voltage current across the chest, fluid is a pretty good electrical conductor. And as fluid leaves the chest with a stroke volume, the impedance to that current changes. And that's the fundamental idea here. And this represents uh, an example that I'll try to show you. This is actually an uh, EKG. It's my EKG. And when I first saw it, I was a little concerned because I thought the PR interval was short. But an impedance signal then is superimposed on it. And this is a very low amplitude relative even to the amplitude of the EKG. It's a very small signal. And in fact, this overestimates what it is. But the size of the signal is, is fractionally only a, a portion of what the EKG is. Well, you can take the signal and you can sample it and amplify it. And if you if you, or you can filter it, and if you uh, filter it such that you take out all these rapid oscillations, you get this slow up and down, which represents the respiratory change. And this is the basis of a lot of our respiratory rate monitors that are dependent on transthoracic impedance. Air is in a particularly good conductor, so as I take a breath, that changes the impedance to a current across the chest. What's done for stroke volume analysis, though, is you amplify the signal again and you filter it in a way that the respiratory variation gets taken out, and you come up with this nice signal, and then you can isolate one of these signals indicative of a cardiac event, and that's exactly what we see shown up and blown here. This would be the Z, or the impedance signal. The old equations that originally described by Kubitschek assumed that the, the chest was a cylinder and applied this algorithm, that stroke volume was the resistivity of blood times the length of the distance between the electrodes, over the baseline impedance in the background times the time that it took uh, for the heart to eject times the first derivative of this signal. There's a lot of stuff in there. And one of the things that I think becomes important is this factor. I apologize, there's two factors there. We'll go forward one more time. Maybe that's work. Is that these two are squared factors. So if you have an error in either of those, the error gets amplified because the variable is squared. And in a perfect world, the waveform is beautiful. The waveform has sufficient fidelity that you can actually detect a range of cardiac events. I'm sorry, this is, so from this you can look at the cardiac events, pre-ejection time, LV ejection time, isovolumeric relaxation. The problem is in the real world, this, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with this. This is what the signal tends to actually look like in an operator room or an intensive care unit with all the movement, distortion, and the electrical uh, characteristics that there's so much, the signal is so poor relative to the noise that you really can't make a lot of distinction from it. And if you look back over the last, uh, even to 1966, and you search impedance cardiography, there's almost 2,300 citations. And overall, the literature really doesn't support the general utility of this methodology in the perioperative environment. Limitations seem to be this poor signal to noise, especially in the OR and the ICU, the influence of multiple factors on this Z0, again, which is a squared variable, the rigid requirement for lead placement, and we'll talk about momentarily. And in response to this, there have been a number of interventions made by industry to make this methodology better. Well, one of them is this NICOM device. And a friend of mine called me several years ago who's a cardiologist and a biomedical engineer and said, you know, I should take a look at this and tell me what you think. And my response initially was, well, I've done a number of things with uh, bioimpedance and if I can get this to work, it's basically just gonna be another bioimpedance device. And I looked at it a little bit more closely. This is an image you can find on the internet, and it made me a little concerned, because here it is telling me that the cardiac index is 2.7, and the sensors are stuck on the table. So it begins to make you wonder a little bit. But in truth, it seems as if this bioreactance, how this device works, is indeed a completely different signal than conventional bioimpedance. And, and it gets down to the point that if we apply a current between two sensors on the chest, that there are two components that alter or influence the flow of current between these two. One is a resistive component, and one is a capacitative component, and those two together comprise the total impedance or the total opposition to flow between them. Well, resistance, this one is essentially a frequency-independent variable. And if you think about it in the terms where we generally live, say, systemic vascular resistance, which is mean pressure divided by mean flow. It's not a pulsatile event. Alternatively, this capacitive, or what's regarded as a reactance component, would be like thinking of the aorta. 
The heart ejects into the aorta, the aorta distends and recoils in diastole. It's a pulsatile component. And if I think about the peak of the timing of that pulse in the proximal aorta and in the radial artery, they're going to actually reach their peak at different times. So there's a delay in the timing between those two events. So that's essentially what this does, is it takes this reactive reactance element, which was frequency component, and it looks at the timing difference between the current that's applied and the voltage that comes out of the chest. And what you see is that the phase, or the timing of the peak between the current going in and the voltage coming out, there's a phase delay between the two of them. So if I put this device on a cadaver, this is essentially going to be a pretty constant relationship. But I really don't care what it is in a cadaver. And in us, this pulsatility, this phase relationship is going to change as the heart fills and the heart ejects and fluid goes off into the center of circulation. And this is an example here, where the red would be the current that's applied, the yellow represents the voltage that is coming out of the chest simultaneously, and as the heart fills and empties, there's this consistent phase shift. And that's what the device does. It quantifies this phase shift. So if we think about this and how it is implemented, and I don't know how many of you have actually used this device. Many folks here. OK. So it involves placing two sets of sensors across the chest. Uh, these two sets of sensors actually treat the chest as two independent circuits shown here. We've got the requisite hardware box. The box then applies a current between the outer sensors on the chest, and the inner sensors in the chest then sense the current so the current goes into the outer sensors and the resulting voltage comes back to the machine between the inner ones. So what the device does is it sends a signal through the outer, the uh, inner then detect the voltage, the box then calculates a time delay between the, the current going in and the voltage coming out, and based on that time delay, it generates a signal. And it is this signal that represents the phase difference, and the phase difference represents the fluid entering and leaving the chest. So how does it work? Well, it takes this raw signal, which is essentially an index of volume, and it's derived from the phase shift. If we then say, all right, this is volume in milliliters, and we look at the rate of change of this in milliliters, it comes out to be milliliters per second. So if we take the derivative of it, and that's an index of flow. And if we adjust that over the systolic interval and the diastolic interval, and we take the area under the systolic portion, or the maximal rate of change that occurred as the volume was changing in the chest, the area under the curve represents the stroke volume. So the way the device works is it calculates stroke volume by multiplying this rate of change by the time over which the rate of change occurred times a constant, which takes into consider age, gender, height, and weight, and that's how it estimates the stroke volume. OK, well, the literature and a lot of people's clinical experience that bioimpedance doesn't seem to work very well in the perioperative environment, and why should this? I, I tend to think of this in terms of the difference between an AM radio and an FM radio. An AM radio has got a lot of static and background noise. The FM's got a more powerful signal. You can put stereo in there, and it doesn't seem to have the same degree of background distortion. The difference here, this isn't really frequency modulated. This would be phase modulated. But in many ways, the parallels are similar. Now, I'll say that there's a uh, difference in the signal to noise ratio. And I hopefully I don't misrepresent this, but it's sort of the way I understand it. The device delivers this high frequency, low voltage current at 75 kilohertz. And this is the information we're interested in. Now, standard bioimpedance, again, at 75 kilohertz, you get this band that occurs where you have oscillation of the signal that occurs between these different areas. And the, uh, using an amplitude modulation, you actually get distortion. So the band is wide. And you, and the ultimate signal represents the information plus the noise that occurred on both sides. Well, the bioreactants, by focusing not on the amplitude of a signal going up and down, but by simply this phasic relationship between the signal going in and the signal coming out, is able to concentrate all the information in this one range. So you're not getting the uh, sum of the noise. You're simply getting the information that's generated by the 75 kilohertz signal. Other potential advantages here is there's no consideration of this Z0. Again, this is a, a, a component of the bioimpedance equation that is squared. So problems with Z0 get amplified because it's a squared variable. Uh, this has been a problem consistently in patients that are obese, those that have a high degree of lung water, or those in a cardiogenic heart failure with a low 
cardiac output. And this is an area that is particularly interesting to me as there's less dependence on lead placement. As I mentioned, um, one of the variables that goes into the bioimpedance equation is the distance between the leads, and that's also a squared variable. So this is, um, I just picked these out off the internet. These are some of the, cardio, uh, the uh, bioimpedance devices that are out there, and I wanted to show the required lead placement that has to be put on to use these individual devices for the algorithms to work. And even in recognition of the fact that this can be a limitation, this is a recent publication actually trying to put sensors only on the arm and away from the chest to derive the same information. Well, this is one of my concerns when we first started working with an ICOM device, and this is a, one of the old figures showing the old configuration of the old type of sensors. But I started thinking about, well, here's the difference between theory and practice. I do a lot of cardiothoracic procedures. We do a lot of esophageal procedures. And if this is the preferred array, what about my patient who's got a central line? He's coming to me and we're going to do an esophagectomy on. They have an incision in their abdomen and their chest and their neck. They're going to get a chest tube on one side. They're probably going to get a chest tube on the other side. They're going to go to the ICU with bandages across all these incisions. A lot of the patients have a pacemaker and AICD, and they're going to get to the unit, and the nurses are going to put on a 12-lead EKG. And all of a sudden, it's looking to me like the sensor array isn't particularly practical. So in theory, while it may work, in my practical world where I live, it's not going to have a whole lot of applicability. So several years ago, I, uh, after local IRB of my wife, I recruited one of my kids, and we did a little study here. And this was done under conditions and anonymity. Uh, he was anonymous is the word I'll try to say. And we put the leads on in a whole range of different arrays on the front, on the back. We turned him over. We put him on his back. We turned him over. And uh, we had a reasonably consistent signal. You probably can't see it from the back, though. And again, I'm inherently skeptical of all these devices. And what I found was that this array in his back, which actually has evolved into the array that, I, array that I use for most esophageal surgery now, was saying his cardiac output was 4.8. Turned him over the same array and his cardiac output was 5.5. I'm going, ah, it doesn't work. This position thing is really a, a problem. The device doesn't work. Of course, then I found this patient showing that when you turn patients from supine to prone or prone to supine, there's a clinically significant change in their cardiac output. So maybe it was the device was detecting a real change and it wasn't an artifact. Well, this gets to another idea and gets back to some of my thoughts earlier. That in the operating room, we move people around a lot. When you have other sensors and stickers, are they going to fall off? Are they going to get pulled? Are they going to get wet? There are going to be problems. And it only gets worse in the ICU. A lot of these times, the patients are extubated. They may be moving around and squirming. And, and if the device can't continually give you information, if the leads are falling off, I don't know what the value is. So if we go back to my sleep study that I did here, um, one of the pathetic things on here is this is only about five and a half hours or six hours of sleep, which unfortunately is common in my house, probably in some of your houses as well. And I tend to sleep like a stone. So I go to sleep and I don't move. But I got to think about this a little bit more. And I don't know about you, but when I drink red wine, I wake up at night, my heart's pounding. Supposedly the tyramine you absorb, the tyramine is a sympathomimetic and, and drives things up. And I, after that happens, I don't go to sleep very well and I thrash around and move. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And there was this paper out there about how two, not one, but two drinks of red wine or alcohol actually raise your cardiac output. So I thought, okay. And in the sake of science, I drank a bottle of red wine and I put the stickers on myself and I hit the button and I went to sleep. And, and Here's what we found. So this is my baseline sleep test. And here it is after my bottle of wine. And in full disclosure, I felt <laughs> awful after this one. I felt great after that. But just as predicted, my baseline cardiac output was higher. But you can see there's an event that occurred. First, there's no gaps in the data as I wiggled around at night. And here's this marked rise in cardiac index. And we're able to break this down a little bit. Oops, this will shift for me. And it shows that this Initial, or this rise was largely driven by a change in heart rate, while this, first, uh, this earlier uh, rise in stroke volume was actually uh, modulated by a change, uh, or in cardiac index was modulated by a change in stroke volume. So what this says is, okay, you know, red wine gives me a hangover and the leads don't fall off at night and do these things really have a place in our practice. And this is the evolution that's going on and keeping in mind my practice in particular cardiothoracic patients. Well, maybe, and uh, goal-directed therapy, but including not just intraoperative management, we're kind of interested on in starting things preoperatively, 
and even carrying all of this on into the postdoc period. Some of the people in our group have actually been using this device as a transfusion guide in children. We'll see how that goes. And also, uh, there's been interest in actually using it in preoperative evaluation, exercising patients, and see what happens to their oxygen delivery. And let me just show you a couple of examples about some things with a preoperative administration. This is a patient that came down and had a big uh, parasophageal hernia, end-stage renal disease. He'd just been through dialysis, had taken off quite a bit of volume. He had shunts, uh, fistulas in both of his arms, so he couldn't easily put an arterial catheter in. In fact, the plan was to put in a femoral arterial catheter after he was asleep. Um, severe long-term hypertension treated with multiple drugs, diastolic failure, and he carried this diagnosis of uh, Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which has the cardiologist all excited about, you can't give him any fluid, you can't give him any fluid, it'll kill the guy. So now he's coming down, surgical procedure, post dialysis, he's gonna be completely dehydrated, and the question was, how much fluid can we give him? And in this setting, even before induction of anesthesia, we did a simple passive leg raise. And he had a marked increase in his cardiac index in response to a passive leg raise, which tells me, if I raise his legs and I translocate three or four, 300 cc's rapidly into his heart, even in the setting of his severe diastolic dysfunction, he was able to tolerate that. And it gave us some confidence that we could rapidly give this man fluid if we needed to, and that's what happened throughout the course of his subsequent induction and his, uh, uh, his early induction and the period of time when he was having his femoral arterial catheter placed. This is another scenario. This is a, just a, a clinical situation of, a, of an esophagectomy. We tend to, I don't know about you, but our evolution of our practice is quite a bit between different surgeons, minimally invasive, and what minimally invasive means, and standard open. But this is, for example, is a patient that had a procedure, was a five-hour esophagectomy, goes to the ICU intubated, sedated, a um, little tachycardic, kind of hypotensive, a little warm, hematocrit's fine, had 400 cc blood loss, got 6,100 cc's of crystalloid intraoperatively. Now in our practice, the, we sort of vary from week to week. Um, well, we worry about giving a lot of fluid because as we heard in the previous talk, there's probably an association with poor outcome. We worry about lung injury that's gonna occur in the post-op period. And at the same time, everybody's told, but if you give a presser to support the blood pressure, it's gonna kill the vascular anastomosis. So we're kind of lost in what's going on between. Again, the patient was hypotensive when they get to the unit. This represents the last couple hours of the procedure, which is a, a laparotomy for isolating the stomach and a gastric conduit, which is pulled up into an anastomosis in the neck. And there's a progressive decline in systolic blood pressure, and in response to the declining blood pressure, the patient received more and more fluid. And in fact, they got 3,600 cc's of fluid over about the last 90 minutes of this procedure, all to keep the blood pressure elevated. Bottom line is when the patient gets to the ICU, they're intubated, sedated on a propofol infusion, their cardiac index is 4.7 liters per minute, and they're still hypotensive. And what this probably shows in our setting with this highly morbid procedure is we have an objective endpoint to say we need a presser, we don't need more fluid. And that's essentially how this uh, technology has evolved for us in our current use. This represents some uh, tracings from patients after esophagectomy uh, postoperatively. This represents their time in the ICU from admission, sort of an overnight. And you can see what happens to their cardiac index. It dips down and down and down. This is based on conventional management where we're not necessarily a protocol, but nobody was paying attention specifically to what the flow parameters were. This represents then a progression over time. Now you have a patient who has uh, a more attention to detail from their volume status. They enter with a higher cardiac index. And over the period of time in the ICU, they have a higher cardiac index. If we normalize that to what it actually means for oxygen delivery, we can see between these two patients there's a distinct difference in their oxygen delivery. I can't tell you that if it made any difference in their outcome, but there clearly was a difference in these hemodynamic variables. We've then gone back as we've evolved into more minimally invasive esophagectomy, which involves you know, a thoracoscopic procedure in the chest, maybe a robotic procedure in the chest, long-term laparoscopy. We've been through a whole evolution on how to approach this, but one of the things that's very clear to us here this is the change in cardiac index in blue or, cardiac, or stroke volume in green that occurs with a pneumoperitoneum. And as you all know, pneumoperitoneum is not benign. Um, we tend to think, well, it's just a minimally invasive procedure, but the literature would suggest, and I think most of our clinical experience supports, that pneumoperitoneum is a pretty substantial load from a cardiovascular standpoint, particularly when you're putting the patients with the head up. 
what we found on some of these when we started to use a number of different devices for measuring flow was that we were pretty good at maintaining blood pressure, uh, let's just say above 60 millimeters of mercury, but in a lot of these cases our cardiac index was well below 2 for 40 or 50 percent of the time, and in fact even lower than that below 1.5 or 7 percent. So, or 1.7 percent of the time. So the point was that just using blood pressure as our standard endpoint and even CVP was probably not adequate for maintaining flows. We wrote a protocol. We went back between a whole series of practitioners at different institutions that were doing a similar approach to us, and we came up with this kind of composite where we um, looked at, if it'll come up there, um, just a small section when we were during the evolution of a minimally invasive esophagectomy procedure where we were measuring flows but nobody was using them for an intervention. And what we found was that only 4% of the time was the mean arterial pressure below 60, but nearly 50% of the time was the cardiac index less than 2, and we had a substantial progression of a metabolic acidosis shown as a progression of the base excess. Well. We then went over and started, this is a very small sample size because we ultimately changed the procedure, with the idea that if we continue to give volume to support this, when we have a pneumoperitoneum and then a head-up position, what happens when we put the patients flat and we take the pneumoperitoneum away? Are we going to have an excess of volume that haunts them into the postoperative period? So we started a procedure in some ways similar to the idea of using dipexamine, where we would use low-dose dibutamine to support the flow during that period of time without giving excess volume. And we found that we, same amount of time that we hypotension divided as a mean pressure less than 60, but a very low percentage of the time when the cardiac index was less than 2. And these uh, very limited data, and again, I'm cautious about this, but um, the limited data showed that we didn't have the same degree of systemic acidosis. We don't apply this anymore because we don't do prolonged laparoscopy in these procedures anymore because we decided it wasn't worth the, the benefit. In any event, the summary of what we have here is that there are lots of different gadgets out there, and there are certainly more to come. Almost all of them work to some degree, but unfortunately many of them work far better in theory than they do in actual practice when we apply them in our clinical environment. When you see uh, validation in uh, studies, you need to look at them very carefully as to what the comparator was uh, and make sure that it is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. It's not an apples-to-oranges comparison. And I get, I again, focus on this idea of theory of practice. Are these devices really clinical applicable? And is the information that it's provided really of clear value, particularly as a singular entity? Or do they need to be really heavily integrated with a variety of other variables? And with that, I'll stop. Thank you.